Huh? Excuse me? I can't hear you. Uh. You said it's who? Oh, peace and blessings. How you doing? It's up to you. I'm on both. You know. So I got the periscope up right now. Now you said Z, cause I know I know two Z's. Z. I got another sister Z. So blessings. What's up, family? To the glory. Amen. No, I'm outside. Gotta go in. I had to get the, I had to get the stand. They saying I got a bad connection. To the glory, huh? Shata. <laughs> Amen. What else I need? You want the living room or you want the room? I'm my ta 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 ta. <laughs> Blessings. Damn, they got a meanest delay ever. My phone, right? Yeah. Whatever you gonna do. I'm leaving. Blessings. <clears throat> yeah. Is this hard? I build an altar here. Thank you. You're welcome. Peace and blessings. All right, let me see. All right. Hey, what's good with the beloved? The glory is on us. Christ came in the flesh. Huh? Hey, Periscope stepping it up. Yes, God. What's going on, family? How's everybody? Huh? For his glory. What's up, Slick? Ah, you've been laying low. All right. Praise God. So, peace and blessings. So, some people... Hey, man. I can dig it. So, some people, they're going to be like, I'm on Periscope and I'm on a conference call. So if people you're on a conference call, if I just start talking about random stuff that it don't seem like it connect to nothing, then it's probably because I'm talking to somebody on Periscope as they comment. Praise God. Praise God for it all. All right, I gotta get a sword so we can go to work. Amen. All right, praise God. So, Father, I just thank you, Lord. I love you today, God. We bless you, Father. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your favor, your love, your grace, your mercy, God, your tender mercies, your loving kindness, God. We thank you for your supernatural hedge of protection, your provision, we just love you today. We thank you for the peace, the love, the joy, the unity, the reconciliation, God, the strong relationships, the marriages, the children, God. We just thank you, Father, for everything that you are, everything that you've done, everything that you're doing, everything that you're preparing, God. 
We just welcome you into this study, Lord God. We ask that you would feed us with food that's sufficient, that you would minister to us by your spirit, God, that you would have your way, that we would be um, blessed, Lord God, eternally, Lord. Give us revelation, God. Give us wisdom, insight, Lord. Teach us how to apply your word to our everyday lives, God. We want to be fruitful, Father. We want to bring fruit for your glory, God. We want to be responsible with our resources, God. We want to do everything that is pleasing in your eyesight. So we ask that you would teach us, that you would open our eyes, that you would open our ears, that you would open our hearts, God. I thank you that you've prepared this moment, Lord, that we can sup with you, that we can fellowship with one another, Lord God. So now we just decree and declare that we're open to receive, God, everything that you have for us to receive. We decree and declare the word to come forth, Father God, um, peaceably and easily to be entreated, God. We come against any distraction or interference in the realm of the spirit, God, in Jesus' name. We decree and declare supernatural unity where brothers dwell together in unity in a place where the blessing can be commanded in Jesus' name, that we're of one heart and one mind, God. Amen. Amen. To the glory. Yes, God. That's too hot. So I want to talk to you to you guys today about storehouses. You know, recently we had a conversation. Amen. Tomorrow is under our rule through his grace. I believe that. Praise God. So thank you for that. Thank you for everybody joining on. <clears throat> I want to talk to you guys today about storehouses. I'm not on what line? I am on the line. Yes, I am. See? I'm on the phone line, sis. Hey, peace and blessings to you. <clears throat> All right, so I want to talk to you guys today about storehouses. Amen. Storehouses. <sighs> so when I talk to you guys about this, you know, I want to talk to you. Remember, I mentioned something to you about the difference between when you approach the word of God, the difference between form and function, form and function. You know, a lot of times we approach the word of God intellectually and, you know, we look at the Bible um, with a literal translation and it is a literal translation. You know, so we read something in the Bible. The Bible says, you know, there's nine fruits of the spirit. Peace and blessings to you. There's nine fruits of the spirit. So, you know, we create a doctrine. It's nine fruits. It's always nine fruits. So if I come to you and say, oh, no, there's ten fruits, you know, somebody's going to argue with me. No, the Bible said it's nine fruits. You know, we're, we're, we're people that it's easy for us to create form from the word of God. You know? No, I don't. You probably my cousin in, in the UK. But it's easy for us to create form with the word of God and our doctrines become these forms and we create these ideas and these pictures about God and the things of God and it becomes a form and fashion to us. We just hold fast to it. We argue our points. We argue our perspectives. And in this, we actually sometimes we begin to lose the very function of the very thing that we're talking about. And, you know, that's how people, we say that's how people get religious because they have a what? Form of God, but what? They deny the very power of, of their, uh, what is the power? It's actually the function. The function of God is more important than the forms that we set up to approach God or to receive from God. Amen. 
with form, we become very uh, one dimensional, like, you know, we only can see it that way. You know, we hold on to our forms because maybe through our forms, we were able to get results in prayer. We were able to get results in ministry. We were able to get people saved. And we stay one dimensional and we defend our forms and we hold fast to our forms. And we actually start to lose sight of the very function that is more important than even in our forms. So when we study the word, a lot of times, you know, we we look at the form, the doctrine, we create a doctrine around it. And we start to lose sight of the real revelation that's really being shared. For instance, Galatians chapter 5 gives a list of the fruits of the Spirit. It gives a list of nine. So we create this doctrine around nine fruits of the Spirit and all these type of things. But biblically, I can show you how there's more than nine fruits of the Spirit. In the Spirit realm, you're not a tree walking around with fruit dangling from you. So there's, that's just Paul using figurative language or actually using the figurative language that Jesus said when he said that you will understand men like a tree by the fruits that they bear. So G Paul took it a step further to describe how if the work of the Holy Spirit is within you, the type of fruits it would bear. So he lists nine there. But if you read Ephesians chapter five, they also list another three. If you read Second Peter chapter one, there's another list. And if you comprise the list together, you get 12, which in Revelation, when they talk about the tree of life, it says it's 12 manners of fruits, not nine. So, you know what I mean? I can I can even go a little further and say that anger can be a fruit of the spirit. See, everybody like how can anger be a fruit of the spirit? Angry is not, anger is not of God. God is not angry, X, Y, and Z. I know because we got all these forms, uh, these formats that we put God in, these boxes. Like, But I can show you how when Moses approached God about something in the Old Testament, God was angry. Moses was not. But the Bible has the audacity to say after Moses had a conversation with God that was angry, the Bible says that Moses came down in the anger of the Lord. That's what the Bible say. It says that Moses actually, from, from spending time with God, received the same anger that God actually had on himself. So we know that God is a spirit. So God produced a righteous indignation with inside Moses. It was produced in him by the spirit. So we, we, we try to hold doctrinally to exactly what the word says, but the word is actually a window for us to look through to see the function or the revelation of God's function and how he function in people's lives. So I'm, I have to just lay that groundwork because what I'm going into, I'm going to be talking more about the function of, the, of storehouses rather than the doctrine of fort storehouses. So please, you know, save your arguments, you know, save your perspectives. I praise God for whatever God has shown you. You know, it's a blessing. I'm not I'm not here. So I want to make three statements. This is this one of the statements. Based on that, I'm not here to try to dismiss anything that God has taught you concerning budgeting, concerning tithing, concerning giving, concerning sowing, praise, whatever God has taught you, praise God. I'm not here to dismiss de or debunk it. But those that are called to my voice, those that are called to me and I call to them, you know that I'm always going to challenge you. I'm not going to challenge to disprove what you're saying. But I challenge to actually expand what you're saying or expand your belief systems or expand your revelation. I'm here to add to it, but I might have to challenge that format or that box that you that you you know that that you might religiously hold to. We all do, you know, and God have to break the box. But God breaks the box by challenging our boxes. So, you know, I'm always going to share something that's from a different perspective, a different angle. And I do that intentionally to challenge you, not to not to crush you or dismiss anything that God has taught you up until this point. But I'm praying that whatever I'm sharing, whether it be similar or even different than what God has already taught you, that you will ask God 
to show you how it applies to your everyday life and how can you use this information to expand on what he's already taught you. Okay, so I just want to lay this groundwork. This is my intention. This is the ministry that God has given me and this is how I flow in it. So if I challenge something that you believe or that you said or different things like that, it's not because I don't, I don't believe the same thing. But I just want to expand on it and build on it. So that's my first point I want to make. That's my first statement, my groundwork. The second thing I want to make is, before I go further into this, I, I, I have no problem with saving, with natural bank accounts, with saving your money, using wisdom, budgeting. I believe in all of that stuff. So I don't want you to take what I'm saying as, as if I'm overriding those um, practical principles of wisdom, of success. I am not. The Bible says that with God, all things are possible. First Corinthians chapter three says that we're laborers together with God. We're in a covenant with God, which means that God plays a part. We also plays a part. You know, it's not all God and none of us. That's that's unrealistic to what the contract or the covenant that God has established with us. We're laborers together with God. That means that God plays a part and I play a part. Now, my part, my part obviously is minuscule compared to God's part, but my part is necessary nonetheless. So we know that whatever is going to be accomplished or the impossible it becomes possible not for God, but with him. The word with denotes a collaborative effort for God and man. It's a collaboration. That's when the impossible becomes possible because we collaborate our efforts with God or God collaborates his efforts with us. Okay, so it takes both. It takes God and it takes man to cause the impossible to become possible. So the scripture I want to use for this is Mark chapter 12, verse 17. When they came to Jesus and they asked Jesus questions concerning finances and what to do with them. They asked, they asked him about paying taxes or the Bible says tribute in the King James. And it's Mark chapter 12, verse 17. Jesus gave them wisdom concerning what to do with their finances concerning bills and carnal natural responsibilities. And Jesus told them, render unto Caesar what Caesar's and render unto God's what's God's. He said, whose image do you see on that coin? He said, Caesar. He said, okay, render unto Caesar what Caesar's and render unto God what's God's. That means, render means to pay what's owed or dude. That means that it's certain things that we pay and it's owed to God, but there's also certain things that's paid and that's owed to man. So, you know, I know we love God and everything. And sometimes we kind of over spiritualize these things. But the reality is, it's my responsibility to pay my rent. Now, God is a provider and I can labor together with God. But God doesn't have a desire to. Can, he can. He has done these things and he can do it. But it's not God's ultimate desire to override our ability to be responsible. Ultimately, God is trying to cultivate his sons or his children to be responsible sons. So he, it's not his desire or his, uh, it's not his, 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 it's not his nature or it's not his innuendo to basically, hello Italy, peace and blessings, to override the opportunities that we can grow in responsibility. You know, so he, he may provide for your rent. He may provide for your rent for a season. When you can't do it, he'll step in. But ultimately, he wants to cultivate us to be good stewards or good, be good managers because our ultimate assignment with God is to manage. He's always calling man or sons to manage. He called Adam to manage the garden, manage the earth. Like You see what I'm saying? He, he called Jesus to manage the kingdom. He called pastors to manage churches. He called mothers and fathers to manage homes and children. You understand? So God, you know, God is ultimately put positioning us and putting us in position to manage something. So he does not want to rob our opportunities to grow in that area. 
You understand? So he said, render to God what's God's and render or pay what's owed to God and pay what you owe man, pay it back to man. So you owe bills to man. So you got to pay it. And we owe tribute to God, which is tithes and offerings. And we got to pay that too. You understand? So I, I like that scripture because Jesus gave a balance when it comes to finances. It's certain things you have to use wisdom that come from God and certain things you use wisdom that come from man. You know, so I just say that because I'm not against the natural wisdoms that we learn about saving and bank accounts and investing and whatever else that we learn. I actually I'm open to receive all that I can. The third thing I want to talk about is, and I'm going to talk about giving, sowing, tithing. You know, God, God called us to be people that make sacrifices. God called us to be people that make sacrifice. God actually called our life to be a living sacrifice. And you know, the difference between giving something and sacrificing something is when you sacrifice something, it costs you, you know, it costs you something. You know, God has actually called us to be living sacrifices, to be willing to pay the price to walk with God. So I know God can ask us of sacrifices. He can ask you to make sacrifices, but I'm not. Th there's nothing that I'm about to teach right now that I'm trying to encourage you to give all that you have, to sow all your money, to tithe to me. I, I'm not asking for your money. I'm not expecting your money. Be led by God. Be obedient to God. If you're in covenant relationship with me, that's one thing. But I'm not using this to get anything from you. I'm not using this to get you to give all your money away either. The Bible says, and pro, you know, and there's with, and this is the wisdom that I got from it. Proverbs chapter three, verse twenty-seven says this. So I'm gonna go to a lot of scripture. So just bear with me the best that you can. Praise God. Proverbs chapter three, verse twenty-seven says, "Withhold." I don't know what that is, bro. Peace and blessing to you. Jesus is Lord. Proverbs 3.27. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due. See, we're talking about rendering. Withhold not good from them to whom it is due. When though, when it is in your power of thine hand to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again, and tomorrow I will give, when thou hast it by thee. So, God says, you know, don't withhold the good thing when it's in your power to do something. Acts chapter 5. Do you know that the first sin in the church that Jesus Christ established was over finances? I just think that's so interesting, that the first sin... In the church that Jesus established after he died was over finances. And it's Acts chapter 5. I'm going to read 1 through 4. Peace and blessings to you. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold the possession and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? So they sold their land. Everybody was doing it. Everybody was making huge sacrifices for the churches early so that the church could survive and the church could grow. And they shared all things, had all things common, and they shared one another and it was a blessing to one another. People sold their houses and land. It was easy to do that because to accept Christ mean that they were ostracized by their Jewish community. So they sold their houses and land and they basically just move with the church, move with the people of God. But this, these people, they said that they sold their houses and land. They kept a portion for themselves, but they lied and told Peter that this was everything. So they, they said that, oh, we're giving 100 percent when in all actuality, they only gave 50 percent of what they said they were really going to give. So they lied about their giving. OK, now, Peter said. He said, why did you lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the price of the land? Now watch this. 
while it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thy own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? And thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So basically, what Peter was saying is like, listen, you ain't even had to lie. You could have kept it a hundred. You could have kept it a bean. You could have said, listen, this is 50%. But you try to lie to God. You try to put on this impression for people to try to make it seem like you was given and say it was 100%. Peter was like, you could have did whatever you wanted to with it because it was in your power to do so. So I'm only bringing that up because I believe that when it comes to giving, sowing, tithing, unless God asks you for a sacrifice, it's within your power to give. It's within your authority. It's, in, it's within your right to make the decisions about how you want to give and how you want to sow. And obviously you can incorporate God and ask God for his wisdom about what to do with it. But God said it's within your power. So I'm not trying to use this to try to take that power away, to make you tithe, to make you sow, to make you give your whole check away. That's between you and God. That's within your power to do so. Okay? So I, do, I wanted to say that because I wanted to avoid any type of debate or argument, you know, because we want to hold to our form or this form or this doctrine or this doctrine. I'm not even sharing this as a doctrine. I pray that as I share this, that God will communicate to you how these things apply to your everyday life. Praise God. <laughs> that sounds like a whole word all in and of itself. Praise the Lord. So I want to talk to you about storehouses. I want to talk to you about storehouses. We was having a conversation and fellowship about saving money. And we was talking about saving money. We was talking about having bank accounts. You know, you want to save money. Some people use a safe or some people save their money in a bank account. Okay. We feel like that's a safe place. You put it in a bank. You, it collects interest. You can go get it whenever you want, you know. But the bank account is up to you how much money you want to put inside of it. It's up to you when you want to take money out. It's up to you when you want to put money in. The thing about a bank account is in your power to use it how you choose. A thing about a bank account that I think about a bank account is you only can take out of it what you put into it. Praise God for that. Cause I <laughs> thank you, sis. Yes, praise God. This is a sword. So, <laughs> so you only could <laughs> you only could and when you have a bank account, you only can make a withdrawal if you made a deposit. If you've made no deposit, then there's nothing there from you to withdraw from. This is in the natural. This is what we understand in the natural about bank accounts. Amen. Praise God. Now, the Bible, you know, bank account isn't something new. You know, it's not even something foreign to God. You know, we don't got to be carnal to learn about bank accounts, you know, because God also had a banking system. God also in the kingdom of God has a banking system. He has an economic system. He had, you know, he has wisdom about what we should do with our resources and our finances. It's interesting that Jesus taught about stewardship and about responsibility of, over resources more than he taught about heaven and hell combined. He was constantly giving wisdom, parables, revelation about what to do with resources all the time. And I thank God for that. So God had a banking system. You know, you know, it doesn't say a bank or a bank account in the Bible. What it says is a storehouse. It says a storehouse. So a storehouse is the biblical term for what we use as a bank account. And when you think about like when you think about it in this way, you find that God has a lot of interesting things to say about your bank account. Like. He has a lot of interesting things to say, praise God. So we're going to talk about some of these things. We're going to talk about, you know, what is a storehouse? What is the purpose of storehouses? Okay. The purposes of storehouse. Now, 
I'm going to go to Malachi chapter 3. It's a famous story. I'm going to talk about this a purpose of a storehouse. Malachi chapter 3. And I pray that you like this revelation. This revelation, I like it, you know, because, you know, we was talking about it on Saturday and my sister was gave a very great point. She said, you know, we give and give and give and give. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. I don't know about that. All right, Malachi chapter 3. I'm going to start. I'm going to read 8 through 12. Malachi chapter 3, 8 through 12. Will a man rob God? God asked the question. Would a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? That just like how could you rob God, like, you know? And that's what they ask, like God, how can you rob how could we rob you? He says, in tithes and in offerings. So not in tithes only, but in tithes and offerings. Two separate things. That's why in fellowship I said it's a difference between giving and tithing. Giving would constitute your offering. Tithing is something different, okay? So, you are, now remember what I taught you. I'm going to prove it to you by the scripture, praise God. When you give, you give for other people. So, it's okay to give and don't expect anything in return. That's the purpose of giving. You're giving for other people needs. Like, But when you sow, that revelation doesn't apply. It's, it's, this, is, this is what the Father told me. The Lord told me that it's spiritual stupidity to, to sow something with no expectation. Jesus said, what farmer goes to sow a seed and doesn't expect? So even God expects a return on what he sows. Okay. Now I know you could say, oh, I sow, I give, we use it interchangeably. But that's exactly why I want to separate it, because sometimes we give and give and give. And we think because we give so much that that basically overrides us tithing like or a sowing. Or some of us, we want to give and give and give, but we don't want to expect anything in return. And that's good for giving because you're giving for that person's need. But when you're sowing, thank you. But when you're sowing, you now become a farmer. So you're putting something in the ground so you can receive the benefit of a later time. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? I love to give. I wrestle with this within myself because I love to give to people. I just love to give. I, I'm not even, I'm not necessarily want, I just want to, I like how people be blessed by my giving. But then there's also a time to sow, the Bible says. So I know that my sowing is something different. It's attached with an expectation. We quote it all the time. We say, God, I'm the head and not the tail. God, I'm the lender and not the borrower. So God says that you're the lender. That means that if you, you're giving with an expectation that it's going to come back to you. We quote it all the time. God, I'm the lender and not the borrower. Okay. So if you're lend, that means that you give something with an expectation to receive something in return. Now, maybe you don't expect it from that person, but you expect that what you're giving is going to in the, in the cosmos and cosmic as a cosmic consequence that you're going to it's going to you're going to reap back from what you sown. OK, now tithing is different. Tithing is for covenant like tithing is for people in covenant relationship. OK, tithing is so that you bring your resources into a, a um a plan or a purpose that's greater than your own. Like if we come together and say we're gonna buy a building, so we all pull together our resources. That's what the tithing is. The tithing is actually a tax. See, when God instituted the tithe in the nation of Israel, it was a tax so that the people that was the government of God would have resources. I.e. the government of God or the priest or the Levites or the judges. Same thing in America. How every time you, you get that check, they take a tax out of there. Like 
And we, we understand supposedly that it goes to the government for the good of the entire nation. And the government decides what to do with those funds and those resources. Well, God instituted a tax to his, his nation, to his people called the tithe. Okay. And the tithe was to benefit those that bear the weight of the government of God. You know, the tithe was for provision for people that lacked for the poor, for poor. And the tithing was for to build the things of God. You know, they used the tithe to build the, um, to rebuild the temple. Excuse me. So the tithe, it has a purpose. It's for covenant. So if you're a member of a church, then I believe that you should be tithing there. Like. I just believe that. Now, I know there's no commandment in the New Testament that says you should tithe. But we know that tithing is a universal law. It's not an old law, old covenant law or a new covenant law. It's a universal law. God instituted the tithe in Genesis. When God said, Adam, you could eat of all these trees, but reserve this one tree for me. That one tree that was reserved for him was actually a tithe. God said, you can have the whole 90 percent, but reserve 10 percent for me. And that's really, truthfully, tithing is the least you can do for God because we're supposed to be cheerful givers. So we should be willing to give to God whenever. So 10% is really the least we can do. Amen. So I'm just breaking this down because I want to talk about storehouses. So I just got to give the backdrop of Malachi. So that's how God said that you robbed me in tithes and offerings. Verse 9, you are cursed with the curse. For you have robbed me. And I'm going to give you scripture, praise God. I didn't even know this scripture until I started studying recently the last couple of days about this. And I came across the scripture that validates that tithing is for covenant. And I'm going to show you. Malachi. It says, you are cursed with the curse for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, I'm, I found up something interesting about God. God is a God of covenant. You can make a covenant with God and God will honor that. You know, God doesn't even have to initiate the covenant with us. We can initiate a covenant with God and God will honor that. The Bible says if a man vow a vow before God, before the Lord, the Lord expect that man to uphold that vow no matter what. Now, what I found out about this Malachi is where it seems like God is being hard on the people concerning them being irresponsible with their resources. But if you understand why God's saying they're cursed with the curse, because when, when they rebuilt the temple and they rediscovered the law in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah brought all the people together and he made a covenant with the people before God. I'm going to show you that scripture. That's why God's saying, listen, y'all made this covenant with me. I expect you to uphold your end of the bargain, just like I'm going to uphold my end. Praise God. So it says, you are cursed with the curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Where do the tithes go? Into the storehouse. Or what? Into the bank account. That there be that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and you shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all the nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Amen. So God said, listen, you're cursed with a curse because you robbed me and you're, you're not being true to our covenant. You're cursed with a curse. But. Bring me the tithes into the storehouse. <laughs> Amen. Bring me the tithes into the storehouse to see if I won't pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. Okay. Now, I got to. Now, what is he talking about when he says all these things? Because it just sounds like he's just saying stuff and we could just make it say what we want it to say. 
But I just want to break down each thing in a practical way, okay? For them. Now, you got to think about these people. They're agricultural people, like, so they farm, they have oxen, they have cattle, you know, they, they you know, they, they pitch tents, they live in tents. They, they pitch tents near wells because wells is important to them. Rain is important to them, like, water is important to them. Their whole livelihood is based on water. Okay, it's based on rain. They need rain for their crops. They need water for their cattle. They need water to survive in desert type atmospheres like, okay, or desert type environments. So now it's interesting. So now I'm going to break, just break some things down. Praise God. I'm just, it's just a good, just some good stuff. Okay. All right. Now, when he says, what the, can somebody block that person, please? I don't got time. So now when he says, all right, when he says, bring me all the tithes into the storehouse, I want to take you to Second Chronicles, right? Second Chronicles 31. This is Bible study, so I've got to go in the Word. Second Chronicles 31. Second Chronicles 31, and I'm going to read 10 and 11. Watch this. Well, I'm going to go to verse 8. And when Hezekiah and the princes came and saw the heaps. No, excuse me, verse 6. And concerning the children of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they also brought in the tithe of oxen and sheep and the tithe of holy things, which were consecrated unto the Lord their God and laid them by heaps. And in the third month, they began to lay the foundation of the heaps and finished them in the seventh month. And when Hezekiah and the princes came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people, Israel. Then Hezekiah questioned with the priests and the Levites concerning the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest of the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since the people began to bring the offerings, which is the tithe, into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat and have left plenty. So the priest said, we have had enough to eat. What? Food. So the priest was able to eat the food and we have plenty left over, which would be for travelers, which would be for the, for the believers, the people that come. For the Lord have blessed his people. And that which is left is this great store. Then Hezekiah commanded to prepare chambers or storehouses in the house of the Lord. And they prepared them and brought in the offerings and the tithes and the dedicated things faithfully. Over which Kanonia the Levite was ruler and Shemalia, Shem, Shemahi. His brother was the next. So Hezekiah, it was so much tithes and offering, praise God, that they didn't even have room enough. It was so much resources being brought by the people of God that they didn't brought to the house of God or the temple of God. They brought it to the temple of God that Hezekiah, they didn't even have room enough. It was so much stuff left over. The priest was able to get blessed and they was able to benefit from it. But it was so much left over for the people of God that Hezekiah commanded them to build treasure vaults or storehouses or bank accounts. He connected them to build storehouses connected to the temple. Exactly. 
It was so much. They said, we got to build storehouses to house this stuff. The, it was so much. Okay. So when, when the Bible says, and Malachi, bring me all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. Why? Because the priest ate from the tithe. They didn't have any inheritance in land to grow the land. So whatever tithe came, the priest or the people that bear the government of God, they were they benefited from that blessing. So God said, bring it so that the people that bear the government of God, they can have they can be blessed and eat. But also travelers and the people of God, the poor, because in Deuteronomy 18, the tithing was every three years. They had to set aside a tithe that was for the poor. Every year for the feast, they had to set aside a tithe that was for themselves. I'm going to talk about that in, a, in other days. But the point I'm saying is that God, it was so much in the storehouses. Now, something happened between then and there. Something happened, you know, something happened. I'm going to talk about this. So it says, God says, prove me there with, see if I won't open up heaven and pour you out a blessing now if you could read in the scriptures that whenever god closed the heaven closed heaven is a sign of famine it's a sign of scarcity it's a sign of a dry season why because you got to remember we're not we're not talking about form we're talking about function so for god when god says that he closed the heaven he not really talking about, I'm, I'm going to break it down. He talking about both, but you can't understand spiritually things without earthly things. So let me explain what he mean naturally. When God closed the heaven, he not, it's not, doesn't mean uh, predominantly that he's not listening to their prayers. What closed heaven mean is that there's no rain, literal rain. Okay. Rain in the old Testament or even in the Bible it means abundance. When Elijah said, I see the, a cloud the size of a man's fist. I hear the sound of abundance. I hear the sound of rain, but he called it the what? Sound of abundance. Why? Because if, you, if you're growing crops, if it rains, obviously you need the rain. Isaiah 55, God said that I make it rain and cause rain to come upon the ground that waters the seed that brings forth the fruit that you can eat. That's Isaiah 55. He says, so shall my word be. What? Similar to rain that comes down. So God does both. They're agricultural people. So God said, you know, when the heavens is closed, he talking about the first heaven, the sky, to where there's no rain. Where there's no rain. Okay. So God saying, I'll open up the window of heaven and pour you out a blessing. The blessing that he talking about is rain. OK, he talking about opening the heavens so it can rain upon you. I could take you to Second Chronicles chapter seven and all these things to show you how when the heaven was closed, it was a sign of a curse or a scarcity or famine. OK. So God said, I, I'll stop that famine. I'll stop that dry season. I'll open up the heavens. I'll cause it to rain on your crops. OK, I'll pour you out a blessing. Now, watch this. Keep I'm going to keep reading Malachi. He says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Now, what is a devourer? A devourer, we know, I'm talking in the natural first, and I'm going to flip it to the spirit. Praise God. Now, they're agricultural people. So what would be some things that would destroy their harvest, will destroy their fruits? Well, the Bible talk about calamities that will happen. You know, it talks about the canker worm, the palmer worm, and the caterpillar. God said, I will restore to you the years that the palmer worm, the canker worm, and the cat have stolen from you. Or the locust, excuse me, have stolen from you. Now, I did a study on locusts. That, that was one of the most devastating things that can happen to people that have farms and cattle and land. When a, when a swarm of locusts will come, it destroys everything in its midst. It, the swarm of locusts is so, it, it's so great, it looked like a dark cloud. 
A swarm of locusts so great that it said that they could start a fire and a swarm of locusts will put the fire out. It's so many of them, they just die and smother the fire out. A swarm of locusts will destroy your whole crop in a matter of moments. So, you know, farmers, they t it takes years for them to cultivate the ground. It takes years for them to germinate and cultivate the right plant. It can take 20, 30 years. That's why it get land get passed down from generation to generation because it takes so much time for farmers to prepare the ground perfectly. And it takes so many years of them taking the first fruits or the best of their harvest to use that to create a harvest in the next season. So they just over years and years, they just take the best seed and continue to germinate it so that they'll get a strong crop. Now, it, a locust can come and devour all that years of hard work and dedication to get the right harvest. Locusts can come devour it. I'm talking about they devour everything down to the soil, everything. That's why God says, I will restore the years you put so much years into doing this, but now it seemed like something has come to devour all of the fruit. So God said, when you pay the tithe, you know, I'll cause it to rain upon your harvest, which is a blessing. He said, I will, I will stop. To rebuke means to stop, to correct. To put in its proper place. So God said, I will rebuke the locusts. I will stop them. I will correct them. I will put these insects and these calamities that come to devour your entire harvest in their proper place. Somebody better praise God with hearts right now. This is what God said that he would do. If you bring the tithe into the storehouse. <sighs> praise God. The storehouse is a blessing. I'm trying to tell you something. So if I bring the tithe in the storehouse, God said that I'll start doing all these things. So God pouring out a pouring out rain, God rebuking the insects that devour the harvest is all connected to the storehouse. Praise God. He says, and you shall, he said, now watch this. Verse 11, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Now we just read that in the King James and it sounds like poetry. But you got to think if you grow in crops, what are the type of things that can happen? If you got trees, uh, apple trees, what's the type of things? Some of the, some of the corruption happens internally, but some of the corruption happens externally. For instance, insects crawl and eat your apples. You know, you see the, the cartoons with the worm and the apple. Right. But also we can have natural disasters. Now, imagine if a strong wind come and it, it can cause the apples to fall off the tree before they're fully ripe. Praise God. I'm just breaking it down in a natural. Y'all praise God. <laughs> so God said, I will stop the winds from coming and blowing. And knocking the fruit off your trees before they fully develop into maturity. <sighs> Praise God. This is all connected to you bringing things into the storehouse. These are the things that God has contained in a storehouse. And I, gotta, I just got to break it down in a natural before I can go in a spirit. Praise God. Okay. So this is what God is talking about. And I just give you scriptural references. Now I want to go to Nehemiah chapter 10. And I know I'm going over a lot of Bible, but praise the Lord for you. God is good. Yeah, brush, the, brush the dust off your Bible. Jesus said, brush the dust off of it. Nehemiah is a tricky. <laughs> he said, when you... When you go into a house and they don't receive it, brush the dust. Some of us, we go in the house, we need to, when we come out, we need to brush the dust off our Bible and read it. Praise God. Now I got to find Nehemiah. That book is a tricky book. Nehemiah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Here we go. Praise God. Nehemiah chapter 10. Now, this is going to bless some of you guys, I believe. This is blessed me. It's so much I want to share. Ooh, wee! I got so much out of these studies, but I'm going to share. I'm going to just try to keep it limited. Praise God. Now, Nehemiah chapter 10. All right, what you got to understand is, okay, Israel and Nehemiah, you know, after the time of Babylon and the people of God was in slavery, you read about that in the book of Jeremiah, okay? They was enslaved, they had to go into bondage, you read about that in the book of Daniel. See, we read these books and we think it's just like chronologically in order, but we don't realize that Jeremiah, Daniel, these prophets, they all existed in the same time. They just was positioned in different places, like... So after that, all, all, you know, the 70 years of bondage to the Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, X, Y, and Z, you know, what happened was, you know, they destroyed the temple of God. They destroyed the holy city of God. And God said that they would do that. Now, Israel was a priest. He was strong in the word of God and he had a desire to rebuild the temple. No, it's not only money at all. You know, actually tithing is not, it's not money like but it is money. In the Bible, they tie their resources. They tie oxen. They tie, you know, um, grain and wheat. But you got, but, and they also tie silver and gold. It's actually a scripture in the Bible that says if they will convert their tithe to money, that is actually more than 10%. It would act, they had to add a fifth percent to their tithe. So if you convert your tithing to money, you would actually be 30%. That's what the Bible says. You know, but they had to, they tied silver, they, they tied a tenth of all of their resources, their cattle, their wheat, their silver and gold. But we tithe money because money represents all those things in one shot. And also money is more convenient for the ministry. So now you go to church, you're not going to bring cats and animals and you're not going to bring 500 can goods. Like you can, but if everybody do that. You're actually making more of a strain on the ministry because now they got to try to figure out what to do with just cans. So it's actually more convenient for you and for the ministry because we can tithe all of our resources, but money represents all of our resources at one time. Money represents what you would pay for food. Money represents what you would pay for clothes. Money represents your time, your effort, your work, your blood, your sweat your tears, your sacrifice, the time that you spent at work, the time you sent away, spent away from your family, it represents a lot of things just with money. So it's actually more easier and more convenient for us and for the ministry that we choose to be in covenant and tithe with to bring the money. Because I had that question too. But I, then I thought about it. God gave me revelation. Like it's actually easier to tithe the money. I mean, it'd be a lot. I mean, a lot of us wouldn't tithe that we had to find a tenth of our clothes, a tenth of our milk, a tenth of this, a tenth of everything, and try to figure out all of that tenth of everything and then bring it to God, bring it to church. Now, imagine if you got 5,000 people bringing a tenth of everything. Like, that's a whole mess. So, if you just bring all this money, I could put this money in the storehouse. Praise God. If you just bring that Visa card and swipe it, it could just go account to account and it just make it so much easier for the functionality of the ministry. So I, I just that's what I believe, you know what I mean? But truthfully, you support you supposed to tithe everything. That's really the revelation of tithing. That a percentage of everything that you have goes to something else, goes to someone else. So you tithe your resources in the natural and you tithe your resources in the spirit too. All that peace not for you, you can share some of that peace. Jesus shared, he said, when you go to a house, share some of your peace. Jesus shared his peace with the storm. Jesus shared his peace with the disciples. So everything that the father gave him, he knew it wasn't all for him. He used the principle of tithing, even with revelation, like, you know, so some God, basically God was teaching us the function of tithing is that actually 
God saying, everything I bless you with, you need to give back to poor, to those that are less fortunate. You need to give back to those that are in leadership over your life. You need to give back to the ministry. like, And that goes for everything. So we, we get so caught up in the form of tithing that we mix the actual function of it. It's very practical. Like God is very practical. We just miss it. You know what I mean? So that's what I believe. Like, you know, um, <clears throat> I know for me, like I'll be giving me a lot of revelation and I just like to keep it to myself sometimes. But the Lord told me I'm being selfish like that. You know why? Because I got a tithe on that revelation. Like some of that revelation got to go to somebody else. God not giving all of it just for me. Or what, you know, praise God. So anyway, so now Nehemiah chapter, Nehemiah and Ezra, you know, they both, they both were, um, had revelation from God about rebuilding what they lost. After their bondage, after everything was destroyed, and they and Nehemiah understood that it that they suffered this consequence because of the sins of their forefathers. So he had a repentative heart, and he wanted to basically reestablish the covenant. Nehemiah had revelation to build the walls. Israel was the priest that understood about rebuilding the temple. So they both had a dimension that of that of revelation that God gave them to rebuild different aspects of of the um of Jerusalem. So Nehemiah wanted to build the the, the um, walls, and Israel wanted to build the priests. Israel was struggling in building. It, it, took, it was taking them years to get it done. And Nehemiah came with help and assistance. And they collaborated their efforts. And they reestablished everything. And what they did was, and if you read Nehemiah chapter 9, they basically was repenting for all, if you read, um, yeah, you read Nehemiah chapter 9 and Nehemiah, yeah, read Nehemiah chapter 9. They basically was repenting for all their sins and they, their, their desire was to rededicate everything that they built back to God and reestablish the covenant that they had with God. Okay? So Nehemiah chapter 9, if you go back, it says this at the end. Verse 33. How be it thou art just in all, just in all that is brought up be, upon us. For thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. Neither have our kings, our princes, our priests, nor our fathers kept thy law, nor hearken unto thy commandments and thy testimonies, wherewith thou didst testify against them. So this is Nehemiah just repenting before God, you know. For they have not served thee in their kingdom, and in thy great goodness thou, that thou gave them, and in the large and fat land which thou gave before them, neither turn they from their wicked works. Behold, we are servants this day. And for the land that thou gave unto our forefathers, unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. So now Nehemiah saying, we messed up, God. We got it wrong. Everything was wiped out. Now we rebuilding. We thank you for what you're doing. We rededicate ourselves to be servants for you, God. We love you. He says, verse 37, and it yieldeth much increase unto the kings which thou hast set over us because of our sins. See, he said that. Look what he said. Because of the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. He un they understood that they was in this bondage because of the things that they did wrong. Also, they have dominion over our bodies, over our cattle, and, their, and, their, and at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. Okay, now verse 10. This is why I said tithing is for covenant. It's a blessing. I didn't even know this scripture. God told me that first, and then I found the scripture. Verse 38, and because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it and our princes and Levites and priests seal unto it. Now, Nehemiah chapter 10, the first 27 verses is basically a declaration with everybody named that was present who signed, basically signed their name on this declaration. OK, everybody that was in agreement with the covenant they made before God. Verse 28. And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, and the Nethilim, Nathanium, and all they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands into the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, everyone having knowledge and having understanding. Listen what they did. They claved to their brethren, their nobles, and, and in, now listen to verse 29. And entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law 
which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and to do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his judgments and his statutes, and that we would not give our daughters unto the people of the land and take their daughters for our, for our okay. Now, verse 32, also we made, so basically they saying, listen, God, we make a covenant before you. We enter into such a bind, a bind or a covenant with you that if we don't go according to this covenant, curse us. That's what they're saying. Verse 29, entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. So basically they said, God, we making a covenant to serve you. We getting back to right relationship with you. We coming into alignment. We're going to come back to all the ordinances. We're going to serve you. And if we don't, God, you can curse us. That's what they're saying. Now, verse 32. Also, we made ordinances for us to charge ourselves yearly with the third part of the shekel, which is the money, for the service of the house of God. That's a tithe. So they basically say that we're going to take a part of our money. We all in covenant that we're going to take a part of our money and dedicate it to the God's house. That's why I said tithing is for covenant. Okay. For the showbread and for the continual meat offering, for the continual burnt offering of the Sabbaths, etc., 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 the holy moons, the sin offerings, and all that. It says, and we cast the lots among the priests and the Levites and the people for the wood offering and to the offerings, etc., etc. Verse 35, and to bring the fruit, first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all the fruit of our trees year by year unto the house of the Lord. So they said that we're going to bring offerings. We're going to bring the first fruit of our ground. We're going to bring the first fruit of our trees every year unto the house of the Lord. So they talk about bringing tithes and offerings. They're making a covenant with God that they're going to bring the increase to God's house. Also, the firstborn of our sons. So there you go, Z. It's more than that. They said we're going to tithe our sons. Glory to God. We're going to bring our children before you. And of our cattle, and as it is written in the law, and the first springs of our herd and of our flocks to bring to the house of God. So they bring in herds of flocks, meat, cattle, children. They bring in a family as an offering. They bring in shekels, that's money. They bring in everything. And verse 37, and that we should bring the first fruits of our dough and of our offerings and the first fruit of all the manner of our trees and wine and oil. Who do they bring it to? Amen. We bring it unto the priest. Now watch this. We're going to bring it to the priest. This is our covenant to bring it to the priest in the house of God. To the chambers of the house of God. What is that? The storehouse. And the tides of our ground unto the Levites. That the same Levites might have the tithes in all the cities of our tillage. They said, we're going to bring the tithes. Where? To the chambers. To the house of God and the chambers. Remember, I showed you in Chronicles that they actually built storehouses connected to the temple. Okay? So the storehouse and the temple is connected. Glory to God. The punchline is going to be mean on this one. And the priests. It says, and the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be the Levites when the Le shall be with the Levites when the Levites take tithe and the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithe unto the house of God to the chambers into the treasure house. So it say the house of God, the chambers or the storehouse or the treasure house. Praise God. For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the corn, of the new wine, and the oil unto the chambers, where are the vessels of the sanctuary, and the priests that minister, and the porters and the singers, and we will not forsake the house of God. Amen. Now I can get to the good stuff. Now that's in the natural. That's in the natural. Now, in the natural, what is God saying? Because <laughs> this is a blessing. I'm trying to tell you it's going to bless somebody. In the natural, God is saying, listen. 
connect with me, come into covenant with me. Bring resources, bring your tithe and offering. Make an agreement to bring your tithes and offering, your resources, all a portion of all your resources to me, into my house, into the house of God. And that's true. Peace and blessings. Into the storehouse that it can be meat, that there can be provision. See if I won't pour you out a blessing, which is opening up heaven so it rain on their crops. Okay, what is that? That's favor. Okay? I'm going to rebuke the devourer. So you giving, 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 and there's a harvest that's supposed to come to you. There's a harvest that's supposed to come from all your sowing. But I'm going to stop the one that try to devour your harvest. The winds come to blow your fruit off your tree before they fully mature, and I'm going to stop that too. It's in the storehouses where my minister bring corn, it's where my ministers bring new wine, it's where my ministers bring fresh oil. Praise God. That's Nehemiah 30, 10, 39. For the Levites shall bring the offering of corn, of new wine, and the oil unto the chambers or the storehouse, where are the vessels and the priests that minister and the porters or the ones that open the door. So, <laughs> glory to God. So, God, what, so now spiritually, what is God saying? Because that's the natural. But we know that the Bible says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, we're talking about how God told you to do in the natural. But now, how many know that there's temple, there's a temple in heaven? In Revelation, which, what's the scripture? In Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, John said that he saw a temple in heaven. Okay? Moses, when he was on the mount, the Bible says that he, it, the pattern, heaven was shown to him and the temple, and God instructed him to build a temple on earth after the pattern of what he saw in heaven. If you read the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel was taken to the temple in heaven and sh the angel showed him all the dimensions of it. Okay? Now, just like in the natural, the temple in the natural, it has storehouses connected to it. So God's temple in the spirit got storehouses connected to it. Now, in the natural, God said that he'll pour out a blessing us, the storehouse is connected with blessings, open heavens. <laughs> Glory to God. The storehouses was connected with open heavens where God can pour you out a blessing. But how many know that the spirit of God is the blessing of God? Yes, it can be. So we know in Acts chapter 2, God opened up the heavens and he poured out the spirit. So God saying, you know, connected to the storehouses is a spiritual blessing. Ephesians chapter one, God said that he got all, God said that he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Where are they at? In the storehouses. Glory to God. God said, if you sow, if you give, if you give into the storehouse, then I open it and pour something out on your behalf. I open it and pour favor out on you. I cause it to rain upon you so that your life can become alive, so that your life can be fruitful, so your life can be productive. And at the same time, I'll stop the enemy from devouring your harvest. I'll stop the enemy from trying to curse you and put stumbling blocks in your prosperity. I'll stop the enemy from causing you to be fruitful in ministry. I'll stop the devourer on your behalf. I'll do it. You don't even got to do it. If you bring your offerings and connect to the storehouse, these are the things that's connected to the storehouse. He said that you curse with the curse. Now, what is a curse? That means that it's a barrier. A curse means that it's a barrier on all this fruitfulness. So God's saying you blessed, but you don't see no blessing. God, you keep giving, but the Bible says in Haggai chapter 1, is you keep giving, but it's like you're giving into a bag with holes in it. You keep seeing your money be depleted. That's what it says in Haggai chapter 1. You save, you give, but it's like you're putting money into a bag with holes in it. 
That's what God said. And you like you keep you keep getting financial blessings, but at the same time, you don't know where the money going. You look in your account and say a thousand dollars, and you're looking again. You say three hundred dollars, and you don't even know what you spent the money on. That's the curse. Like that's the barrier from you actually prospering and, and going forward and being more increasing in your fruitfulness. I mean, God said, I didn't. I, that's not my choosing. That's you not coming into agreement with the covenant that I made with you. That if you bring your resources, I'm going to open the windows of heaven. Like, I'm going to pour out spiritual blessings. I'm going to rebuke the devourer. Like, I'm going I'm to cause it so that you're not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, hint causing the fruit of your tree to fall before it mature. See, the enemy has sent the wind of doctrine to try to get you to go before God. Like, Jesus was, is the head of the church, but the enemy gave a wind of doctrine that tried to get Jesus to be the head of the church before he was fully developed. See, the enemy will blow a wind of revelation. The enemy will start teaching you or trying to give you a, a perspective that will try to get you to be the prophet before it's your time. You're trying to pastor, be, you're trying to go before you sent. You see what I'm saying? We underdeveloped like. So that's what God is saying. If you if you connect to the storehouse, I'll stop that from happening. I'll stop things from uh, uh, I'll stop, you know, things from um, hindering your your maturity and your development. That's what he said. He said, I'll stop the winds from blowing your fruit before they fully mature. God wants us to have mature fruit. God wants us to have a mature testimony. God wants us to have a mature witness. But sometimes we try to go before we mature. God said, I'll stop all that from happening. I'll stop the enemy from trying to convince you. I'll stop people from trying to exalt you before it's time. Praise God. And I'll grow you into maturity. You understand? God said he got, he got corn, which is prosperity. God said, I got new wine. God, don't you know, look what he said in the natural. The Levites bring the new wine into the storehouse. But God got storehouses in heaven that the angels got new wine in there. What is the, what is the new wine? That's a fresh anointing. You understand? That's a new revelation. That's a new grace come upon you. It's oil there. It's corn, which represents prosperity. There's new wine, which represents new revelation. There's fresh oil there, which represents a fresh empowerment from God, all in the storehouses. But the storehouse is a bank account. And we know a bank account, you can't make a withdrawal if you never make a deposit. So that's why God said, bring me the tithes. That's why God said, make a deposit into the storehouses in heaven. And then you can make a withdrawal. See, we want to make withdrawals and we ain't made no deposits. Now, I'm about to prove that to you because it just sounds like I'm just using that like a good sermon, you know. But I'm going to prove it to you by the scriptures. Praise God. Praise God. I'm going to give you some scriptures. Now, I'm going to give you some different things about storehouses. Now, how can you store stuff in the storehouses in heaven? By giving. Now, you've been giving, 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 and sometimes you don't even see a return. Sometimes you don't receive a return because you don't ask. Praise God. Sometimes you don't receive a return because you don't even know that when you're giving, you're actually putting stuff in the storehouse. And it's building interest. So when God pour, open up that thing and pour it back out onto you, it's 10 times greater. It's 100 times greater than what you gave God. You can't beat God's giving. Now I'm going to give you some scriptures. Jesus says. Matthew chapter 6 verse 19. I got to give you the word. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Now watch this. It's a blessing. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Jesus says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. 
So God said, you're trying to save it in the safe. You try to save it in a bank account. I'm not knocking those things. But God said, it's, anything can happen to those things because it's in the natural. So it's, for, it's better for you to lay it up in a, in a bank account that nothing can happen to it. Praise God. Listen what he says. But verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Listen what he says. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Who lays it up? I do. What, 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 what is he saying? Lay up. He's saying put it away. What, what do you mean put it away? Save it. So Jesus said you could save it in a bank account in the natural. There's nothing wrong with that. But Jesus said, you know, it's a lot of stuff that can happen to it in the natural. We know that the banks can fail. You can lose money and everything. The whole economy can fail and you'll lose it. But God said, I got a financial economy that it does not fail. So you can do it that way or you can put your stuff in the storehouse of heaven. He said what? Lay up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven. That's what Jesus said. What happens? Why is it better? Where neither moth nor rust doth, nor rust doth corrupt. Same thing with the tithe. He said, bring me the tithe into the storehouse. What? I'm going to stop the devourer. Nothing going to devour it like. Nothing going to devour your harvest. Nothing going to devour your, what you gave because it's in the storehouse in heaven. Praise God. Where thieves do not break through and steal. Well, who's the thief? We know that Satan, Lucifer, fallen Satan, comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. We know that he comes about like a roaring lion seeking who or what he can devour. But God's saying... That there's a protection that comes to you from the devourer. He can't steal because your stuff is in my storehouse. Praise God. Now, let me tell you, this is, this is now, that's talking about protection. Now, let me tell you that's such a blessing. If you study the Hebrew word for storehouse, okay, it's the word asam. That's how it's pronounced. But it's, if you break it down, the Hebrew words, because I love the study of words. So I like to study the words in the Greek and the Hebrew. But, I, you know, I just like I just like etymology and the study of words and semantics because you just get so much from it. But in this word, you know, when in, in, in the Hebrew language, they usually break they down, they words down in three syllables for the most part. And then it's like each syllable is a letter. OK, each syllable is a letter. Now, the Hebrew language is so rich. It's like Chinese language, African language. You know, it's so much richer than, uh, you know, English language. Because the way they pronounce their words, they, they pronounce it with more verbiage, with a more ra or ha, you know. Ha, you know, the Hebrew is like ha. Sound like they about to throw up, you know. But it, it's, it's just so much more lively, their language. Not only do they have words, but they put pictures and meanings to every word or every letter. So the Hebrews also have that. With every letter in the alphabet, they have a picture with a definition even to the letter. So it's a blessing. So the three letters for the word Assam is Aleph, Sam Samak, and Mem. Okay? Now, Aleph means strong and powerful leader. Samak means like a um, protector or like hate or protect. Hate means to reject or like protect. And mem means the blood means blood or means mighty. So Aleph Samak Mem Asam. It's Aleph Samak and Mem. What is this word uh, Asam, which means storehouses or barns? What is it? It's break down to Aleph, Samak, and Mem. What is it saying a storehouse or a barn of God is? It's actually the strong and powerful leader that rejects those, that, that protects those that are his blood and his mighty ones. Okay? The strong and powerful leader that protects those that are his blood and his mighty ones. That's what a strong tower is in the Hebrew, like. So then it makes sense why David said this. The name of the Lord, what, is a strong tower. The righteous can run into it and what? They are safe. 
The name of the Lord is a storehouse. The righteous can run into it and they are safe. God said, if you sow and you come into the storehouses, I keep you safe. I keep all your offerings safe. I rebuke the devourer. I'll stop the enemy from stealing from you. Glory to God. <laughs> so I just thought that was interesting as I was doing this study. Like, you know, there's safety in the storehouse of God. Now I'm just we did, now we know that giving is connected to the storehouses. Just what Jesus just taught us. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So he said you could lay up for, for you could lay up for yourself treasures in the storehouses of heaven by giving. Okay? So your giving is not in vain. Even if you haven't seen a full manifestation, even if you haven't seen a full fruitfulness of what you're given, it's not in vain. It's in the storehouses of heaven. Nothing going to corrupt it. The enemy can't steal it. It's protected by God. He protecting his blood and his mighty ones. Like he's protecting the resources. Like enemy can't even touch it. Revelation chapter 12 talk about a seed that was taken to heaven and the, the dragon tried to devour it, but it was caught up to God where it couldn't touch it. So your seed can be caught up to heaven in the storehouses where the enemy can't even touch it. And it's actually accumulating interest. It's accumulating interest. Why? How do I know that? Because the Bible says, give and it shall be given unto you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, runneth over. So that's an increase. So God's saying you give. It's in the storehouse of heaven. You under you, you wonder why what's going on. God said, I gotta collect an increase. I gotta collect an interest and increase. So when I give it back to you, it's a good measure that's been pressed down, shaken together, runneth over like. And then when I open up that window, I open up the vat of that storehouse and pour it upon you. You understand where I'm going with this, like. You know, it's, it's many ministers and prophets and stuff that have been to heaven. And Jesus, I'm always fascinated about the storehouses. Jesus would take them to the storehouses. Mary Kay back to Sadu. It's so many people. They've been taken to the storehouses and they showed them things. Not only finances, riches and gold, but healing, anointings like fresh oil. It's literally there. It's literally there, like, you know, bowls of oil, like, that they keep in the storehouses. That's actually anointing that God want to pour upon people. It's spiritual gifts that God want to pour upon people. I remember Mary Kay Baxter said that she was talking to Jesus about the storehouse. And he, and he was crying. She's like, well, why are you crying? He said, he said, because all this stuff I stored up for my people, but they don't even believe me for it, like. They went to another place, another storehouses where it had limbs, arms, legs, like the thing that you, you, you know, you see somebody walking around with a nub, but in the storehouses of heaven, they, there's storehouses where they have new limbs for people. They got new limbs for people like God got new hearts for people. God said, I give you a new heart. <laughs> you understand? They got new, they got storehouses with new organs and everything up there. Like, and Jesus said, it's for the people. It's not for heaven. It's for us. Ephesians chapter one says that, that God has blessed us with spiritual blessings. That's in heavenly places. They in storehouses. We just don't know how to, we don't realize that we access them by giving spiritual bodies. God said, I give you new bodies. You see what I'm saying? We access the storehouses by sowing, by making a deposit. See, somebody like, oh, he talking about depositing. He talking about depositing withdrawal. That's what Jesus taught. Jesus talked about sins and forgiveness. God is rich in grace and mercy and we're inheritance of that. So now we have access to the storehouse of God that is mercy. We have access to that. So when people offend me, I can give them God's mercy. Somebody posted on Facebook, oh, man can't forgive sins. Yes, man can forgive sins. Man can forgive sins because you're the body of Christ. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul said, if I forgive a sin, 
I forgive it in the stead of Christ. We come in Jesus name. We come in the authority of the one that sent us. We ambassadors, which means we represent or we stand on Christ's behalf so we can forgive a sin. I can tell you your sins are forgiven. That's what Jesus told the disciples in John chapter 21. Jesus told the disciples, whatever sin you remit is remitted unto them. He said, whatever sins you retained is retained unto them. That's why God, that's why Jesus is so strict when we don't forgive people. Because it's actually a misuse of authority. Like, you see, exactly. When we, that's why Jesus, like, if you don't forgive people, God won't forgive you. And he dead serious about that. You know why? Because we have access to the mercy of God. And we can extend that from, to people from God's storehouse. We can withdraw that because we made a deposit. We say, God, I give you my life. I ask for forgiveness of sins. Then God give us forgiveness. Now we become an heir of God. Now we got access to the storehouses of the things that belong to God. And we can say, God, forgive this person for what they're doing. We can say, God, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. That's what Jesus did. That's what Stephen did. He said, God, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. He was, he was, he was making a withdrawal. See, when I was locked up, we couldn't have the money in our pocket. So we would have an account somewhere that when people gave us money, it would be in the account. Now, when I can access the account whenever I wanted to, I just can't physically access it, access it myself. So I would they had these papers that you would have to fill out and they was called business remits. Now, I would take the paper and fill out how much money that I wanted to come out of my account. That's my money and give it to somebody else or give it to buy a book or whatever. It was called the remit. So when I, I use the business remit to make a withdrawal from my account, I couldn't physically access it, but I can use a petition to access the storehouse of what is already mine to release it. Pray, we also access the storehouses through prayer. Through prayer. See, when I say, Father, I bless this person. What I'm doing is I'm, re I'm making a withdrawal from what is in my storehouse. From what I've sown, the prayer I've sown, the money I've sown, the sacrifices I've sown, the deposits I've made, I've sown into the spirit. Now I can receive from the spirit and I can actually withdraw it and remit it and release it into somebody else. I say, Father, I release this. That's what we call an impartation. I could put it upon you like I could put it upon somebody. Jesus has so much peace. That he can make us withdraw from the storehouse and put peace on people. Amen. I don't know. Maybe this helping somebody. I don't know. But this stuff is a blessing to me. So now you got storehouses in heaven. Right? And I'm going to finish with this because there's so much more I can go into. Now I'm going to tell you something else that's also a storehouse. People are storehouses. Now remember, the temple, which was the house of God, had a storehouse connected to it. The temple had a storehouse connected to it. In the natural, in heaven, the temple has a storehouse connected to it. That's in heaven. Now God says, 1 Corinthians, that we are the temple of God. Know we not that the body is the temple of God. So now the body of Christ or people are the temple. Now we understand from the natural illustration in the Old Testament and what is the illustration in heaven that every temple has a storehouse connected to it. But the Bible says you are the temple of God. So you as the temple of God has a storehouse Connected to it. So people are also storehouses that you can make a deposit into them. And as you make a deposit into them, you can make a withdrawal from them.
Now I want the scripture on that. Okay. Okay, I'll give you this scripture first. Luke 6, 38. Now think this, keep this in mind. Now I'm, you're going, you, we all know the scripture, but it's going to sound different. Now that you know that. Luke 6, 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together. And running over, shall men give, where? Into your bosom. He didn't say, shall men give to you. He said that men shall give into your bosom. Now, I have to define the language because King James used the language bosom often. Or the chest or the breast area. The Bible says that Jesus came out of the bosom of God. In John, the Bible says that Jesus came out of God's bosom. Now remember, form and, f form and function. So form, you can actually think about his chest. And you're like, well, dang, how did Jesus come out of God's chest? But it, when it's talking about the bosom, it's actually talking about what is inside there. So what organ is it? So when it says that Jesus, think about the function. When it's saying that Jesus came out of the bosom of God, what, is, what, what, the, what the Spirit is communicating to us is that Jesus is the heart of God. So we got the mind of God and the heart of God. The mind of God is the law and the knowledge and the wisdom of God. But the heart of God is the grace, the mercy, and the love of God. So in that same context, when it says Jesus came out of the bosom of God, or saying that he the heart of God, in that same scripture in John, John reveals to us that um, the law or the knowledge of God came by Moses. That's the mind of God. But grace and truth or the love of God came by Jesus. That's the heart of God. So when it's talk about the bosom, it's actually talking about the heart. So when, now check now. Glory. <laughs> so listen. So God's saying when you give, men are going to give. But where are they going to give it to? They're going to give it to your bosom. But what is the bosom? What's the function of the bosom? The heart. So he's saying that men are going to give into your heart. Now, the heart is the storehouse of your temple. The heart is the storehouse of your temple. The Bible says, guard your heart. Why? Because out of it flows the issues of life. God said, I open up the window of heaven and pour you out a blessing. So I'm a flow out of the storehouse. So the, the heart is the chamber, it's the storehouse of your temple. In your heart, it contains your anointing or your new wine or your fresh oil or your corn, your prosperity. The Bible says your soul or your heart or your suke, your heart and mind, your soulish dimension has to prosper, okay? So God saying the heart is the storehouse. I'm gonna prove it to you by the scriptures because I'm gonna give you another scripture that's gonna back it up, okay? So I can sow into you, I can give into your heart, into your storehouse. I can give to you and actually make an investment into your heart or your storehouse. We know that the heart, we, we believe with our heart. So we know that our, our heart holds faith. God is in our heart. So we know that our heart is actually the habitation for God himself. Or it can be the habitation for another spirit. Okay, we know that we hope with our heart. The love of God is shed abroad where? In our heart. So that means that God put love, he stores it where? In our heart. Because your heart is a storehouse. Now I'm going to back up how I can give to you and I can actually give into the storehouse of your heart. And, and I can actually make a withdrawal from that. And I'm going to close with this. Luke chapter 16. This is the parable of the good steward. Now watch this. 
The steward was going to get fired. Verse three. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do for my Lord? Take away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg. I am ashamed and I am resolved what to do that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called at now. Listen, when I lose my job because I, I try to deal shrewdly, but my boss didn't like it, I might lose my job. So what can I do that's going to benefit me and I can be received by other people? Watch what he said. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, how much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said, take thy bill and sit down quickly and write 50. So he basically gave everybody a discount. Now, I'm not saying that you should do this. I'm not saying be unwise on your job because the Bible, okay. He says, so he called every, so he said a hundred measures. Okay. Verse seven. Then said he to another, and how much owest thou? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, take thy bill and write four score or 80. And the Lord commend, now listen, the Lord commended the unjust steward. So God is telling you he unjust. What he doing is not just, it's not fair. It's not righteous. Because he had done wisely, but Jesus did recognize wisdom in what he was doing. For the children of this world are in their generation wise and the children of light. But we're going to stop that in this generation. Praise God. Verse 9. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Jesus said, Jesus said, make friends with rich people. I mean, that's just what he said. Make friends with those that have resources in the natural. Make friends with them. What he's saying, build relationships with them. He says, why? He tell you why. That when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. So what's the everlasting habitation? It's your soul. Your soul is either going to go to heaven or hell. It's going to last forever. Just somewhere. But it's also a habitation. It's also a storehouse. So God said, make friends, do like this wise person and make, use your resources to build relationships. Give to build relationships. Sow into people's lives to build relationships. Why? So one day, if things aren't going well with you, they will receive you. In other words, so build that relationship, use your resources to sow into people's lives, to bless people and build the relationship with them so that maybe one day, if it's not going well with you, you can go to those people and because they already received what you did in the bosom, in the heart, in the everlasting habitation, which means that they say what? This how you know. This how you know you did that because they like, you know what? I'll never forget what you done for me. Yeah, a person never told you that? They'd be like, you know what? I never forget what you done for me. That's the evidence that you sown something into their storehouse. Like what you did bless them so much. Basically, they saying, man, I never forget you for what you did for me. You will always be in my heart. That's the type of relationships Jesus wants you to build with your resources. So now when things not going well with you, you can go to those people like, you know what? Things not going well. They're like, you know what? Listen, I'm going to help you. I'm going to bless you. That's how it works. This is what, this what Jesus taught. But we, we try to be too spiritual. And that's why Jesus said the people of the world is way wiser than you like. Because they know how to do this stuff. But we too busy being spiritual. You understand? So I'm saying these things because the storehouses, it's a blessing in storehouses. Whether natural storehouses, whether the house of God, whether it's the storehouses in heaven or people. God's saying, give, build healthy relationships, build covenants, and you will receive, receive the benefits. 
You'll receive of the spiritual blessings and the natural blessings. I'll pour my spirit out. I'll pour my favor on you. I'll rebuke the devourer. I will protect your harvest. I'll cause you not to keep going in cycles where you start maturing a little bit and then you, you, you mature two steps forward, but you take four steps backwards. I stop that like. But if you don't give, you curse with a curse. You got all these barriers that's hindering you from being fruitful. But I'm trying to tell you, if you give, if you sow, if you come into a covenant relationship and tithe with a ministry that's doing my work, I will command these blessings on you. That's what it's now. Listen, this is my last scripture. Deuteronomy 28, 8 says this. God said, I will come, com I will command the blessing you. In your storehouse. God said, I will command a blessing upon you when you connect to the storehouse. So we need to sow, sow into the spirit, sow into people's lives, take our resources and build relationships. Build, that's how, listen, God used gifts. God used his resources to build relationships. God does this. God took the, 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 the most valued commodity in heaven, which is Jesus Christ. God took heaven's greatest treasure. God took his greatest treasure and gave it. God took his greatest treasure and sold it. God used his greatest treasure to build a relationship with me and you. That's what he did. God used gifts to build a relationship with us. God loved us so much that he gave a gift. Salvation is a gift. Jesus is a gift. The Holy Spirit is a gift. Our whole walk with God is about gifts. God built your whole relationship with him off a gift. This is what God himself do. You understand? So we're not going to allow the enemy to, to make excuses why we can't give. We can't give to God. We can't sow into people. We can't tithe. We can't come into covenant relationship. God is all about covenant like. You see where I showed you in Nehemiah, how they say, God, we're going to come into covenant with you. We're going to tithe. We're going to bring our offerings. God said, then do it. Then I'm going to bless you. I'm going to cause it to rain, blessing abundance upon you. I'm going to cause you to be fruitful. I'm going to rebuke the devourer. I'm going to cause you to get out them cycles and you're going to grow on maturity. I'm going to bring new corn, new wine, new oil. <laughs> I'm going to command a blessing. See? I'm going to cause you to have healthy relationships with people where when you fall, somebody else will lift you up. It don't even got to be financially. It could be financially. You sowing into people and then when you go through a hard time, them people are ready to help you. Not saying that you got to, it may not necessarily be them, but you can count on them. We in a covenant relationship. Uh, you know, it's the same thing with God. God said, now nah, listen, listen, I need y'all to bring an offering to me so I can do some things. Then we go to God, listen, God, my, my bill is due. You understand? <laughs> you made a deposit, you can make a withdrawal. D don't you notice how people can call down healing? Don't you know that? Don't you know that that's how I could pray a financial blessing upon you? Because of what I deposited into my storehouse. Now, I could just command a financial blessing on your life. Command a financial miracle. And I know some of y'all can testify that I pray for you and those things is happening. Now, I don't just pray for you to have financial miracles. I, the same financial anointing that God placed on my life for that stuff to happen. I, I, I gave it to all of y'all. Like, I pray for y'all to have it. I don't just pray for the miracles. So now you can pray for people and those same finances happen. But I went through a season where I ain't work. I went through a season where I ain't work. I was making sacrifices. I was sewing, sewing. So I didn't even had no job. I was sewing thousands, like. And then after I went to that season, and I I got my job, God told me. He said I gave you a new anointing. He said I gave you an anointing for finances. I was like, God, I don't know what that means, but I'm about to try it out. 
So I just started praying for people and they just started getting financial type of miracles and increases. I mean, I can't control it, but it just come upon people. I'm just saying, because if you make a deposit, you can make a withdrawal. God been having you give, 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 because he got you making a deposit. So when it's time for you to make a withdrawal, it's going to be a lot of fruit. Praise God. In the spirit and in the natural. Your giving is not in vain. Your sowing is not in vain. And your tithing is not in vain. Be consistent with your giving. Be consistent with your sowing. Be intentional. Have an expectation to tie to it. Be in covenant relationship with your tithing. Praise God. Storehouses. We got storehouses, y'all. Let's start utilizing our storehouses. Amen. The Bible says when you pray, break, pray, go into your closet. The Bible says when you pray, go into your closet. Do you know that that word closet is actually storehouse? God said, when you pray, go into your storehouse or go into your steward, your stewardship closet is another word that they use. It's funny how communicating with God and budgeting is connected. God said, go, pray with the same place that you budget everything at. Pray, pray where your resources at, because if you pray where your resources at, I command a blessing upon it. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that as I spoke, you stretched forth your hand. We thank you that there's a grace upon us even now, Lord God. To sow, to give, to tithe, to build up your storehouses that they may be meet in your house. I thank you, Lord, for every deposit that you led us to make. I thank you that we have the opportunity to make withdrawals. I thank you for this teaching. I know it was lengthy. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to each person in their own language these revelations. Lord, they may not understand everything that I said, but I thank you for what they do understand. Because whatever they were able to understand is what you were saying. I thank you that you prepare tables for us, Lord God, a feast. We may not, we may can't eat everything on the table, but you still prepare it, prepare it. So that we all can eat. Holy Spirit, help us to apply this to our everyday life. Lord, I pray that the devour was rebuked. I thank you that the windows of heaven were opened. I thank you for connecting us to our storehouses. I thank you, Lord God, that we are rich in you. I thank you that we have access to our storehouses through petitions. I thank you, Lord, that the curses are broken by Jesus Christ, the seed that was given. I thank you, Lord, for the spirit of liberty that frees us to freely give, to freely sow with expectation, to freely tithe, God. Because we love you, because we love the work of the ministry, because we love the people that the meat is supposed to benefit God. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Now, Father, I, 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 I access, Lord God, the storehouses of peace that belong to Jesus Christ. The peace that you leave with us, Jesus. I leave with them. That as we go, we'll go in peace. That as we're led, we're led forth in peace. We thank you that that peace that comes from your storehouse, Jesus, will be the umpire of our soul. That we, it will keep us, that it will guard us, our heart and mind from stress, worry and anxiety. That tonight when we go to sleep, that we can rest in peace. I thank you that that peace is so supernatural that it's calming every storm. Over our finances, over our homes, over our emotions over our minds, over confusion, in Jesus' name. And that we'll be able to rest in peace. Amen. All right, y'all. I love you. Thank you for sticking with me for this long scope. I pray I blessed you. God bless you.
I believe Christ came in the flesh. 